Now the time comes up where uh, our host, the chairman, and uh, our beloved organizer of this meeting for the last 14 of them to give the final talk. Uh, I don't think he needs any introduction. Beside me, I will just read from my own memory. I think uh, him and the previous speaker have come and think they both graduated from the same institution, Oxford. And uh, then a long journey of uh, Tony was very fruitful in many aspects, from zeolites all the way to hybrid systems, metal organic frameworks, perovskites. It's 50 years of long, long hard work and exciting things. And uh, he's actually a professor still uh, at the University of Santa Barbara and uh, in the US and Singapore. After spending great time in Cambridge, then come back to Santa Barbara. And actually, I forgot to call you sir. So the floor is, is, the floor is yours, uh, Sir Tony Cheatham, who got actually ignited by the late queen in a pair member 2020. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Thanks, my friend. Thank you very much for your kind words, Mohammed. And uh, yes, 50 years is a long time. But uh, let, let me not get too worried about that. I'm sort of thinking about what we're going to do in the next couple of years. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is really a story that began more or less um, as Rat Cam began as well. So I started thinking about this um, and doing something that Matt mentioned, thinking about physical properties of moths back in 2007. And we uh, wrote a, a nature perspective or news and views on it. Uh, CNR Rao and I, and um, so what I'm going to talk about is the work that started then, as you will see, and uh, where it's reached today. And so the, uh, this is UC Santa Barbara, by the way, which is uh, n not a bad place to retire back to and get rehired on the faculty. It's a beautiful campus. Um, an overview of the talk is that I'll just say, I'll give a, a brief introduction to perovskites. I don't need to say very much because so many people have talked about them. Um, and the tolerance factors, uh, again, I don't need to say much about, but I, I'll mention a couple of points. And then uh, the talk about hybrid perovskite formates, which we've done a lot of work on over the last 15 or 16 years. And then hybrid perovskite formates, which have the rhenium trioxide structure, uh, which is related to some of the things that, that Matt just talked about, and then talk about uh, future challenges. So the uh, inorganic perovskites are familiar to everybody, I think, even the organic materials colleagues and, and so on. And they're the kind of workhorse of condensed matter physics and solid state chemistry and with lots of wonderful examples with exciting uh, properties. And they still continue to deliver exciting opportunities in, in the condensed matter area. And this structure of calcium titanate has been known since 1925. The evolution of perovskite since then um, took some time to uh, evolve towards hybrid perovskites, and so the first hybrid perovskites made by Weber in 1978, I think, uh, and he made the methyl ammonium lead iodide that we've heard quite a lot about in this conference because of its exciting photovoltaic applications. And um, it's interesting because the recognition that this was uh, exciting for PV applications took another uh, 30 years, it was, you know, so the materials discovered in um, 1978 and it was 2009 when the breakthrough came. And people had studied it for all sorts of other reasons in the meantime, mainly things like order disorder transitions of the um, alkyl ammonium cations and phase transitions associated with that. And then the next 
Well, in that particular case, we have the amine on the A site replacing the calcium in calcium titanate in the cavity of the perovskite structure. The next evolution was in 2004 by Gao Song in uh, Peking University. And he made a system uh, which is, we see here, in which not only does he have an amine cation in the cavity, but he also has, he, as it were, replaced the oxygen bridge with a formate bridge. And, and so it, this expands the cavity and means that you can put a whole variety of larger amine cations into the system. And, um, and these things have some exciting opportunities. So that was 2004. Um, there's, in, in the meantime, there's been a quite rapid uh, discovery of multiple hybrid perovskites, um, ranging from the ones I've just mentioned, but there were also the things like hyperphosphites, which we worked on when I was in Cambridge, Azides, I'll mention something about the azides. Azide is isoelectronic with thiocyanate, essentially, so it's a, a linear linker. And there are thiocyanates and uh, other cyanide-related things, the uh, Prussian blue, blue analogs and so on, and even borohydride and perchlorate linkers. And so this is a very diverse area. Um, the Goldschmidt's tolerance factor, which was uh, first proposed in 1926. And I think this is a remarkable thing because the tolerance factor concept was proposed about 10 years after the first sort of real diffraction, X-ray diffraction experiments were done. And so there was enough information in that 10-year period about the unit cells of perovskites that Goldschmidt could propose a geometrical criterion for making a perovskite based upon the sizes of the A cations, the B cations, and the linking anion, um, as shown here. And almost 100 years later, we're still using it. And, and it's, it's sort of stood the test of time. Um, what we did with Gregor Kieslich and Xi Jing Sun when I was at Cambridge was simply to extend this to hybrid systems. Um, so we had to assign radii to all the amine cations and other cations, assign sizes to the cylinders of things like the formate. So we treated those as cylinders. And this worked remarkably well, um, not only for the things like the metal ammonium iodides and so on, and for the formates that we were working on, but for a lot of other systems, um, as, you know, like the ones that um, Matt was just talking about. So this is a, a very useful tool. Um, it's not the only descriptor for perovskites. So satisfying this is a necessary, but not, not always a sufficient condition to get a perovskite. And we've done a lot of work. There's a poster um, by uh, Greg Kent, uh, this afternoon, where he showed that you, you, we've been able to do something in Santa Barbara, which is to make double perovskite iodides, which have never been properly made and characterized before. And we, we realized a couple of years ago, uh, working with Pratap Vishnoi when he was in Santa Barbara, that you also have to worry about whether the, um, for a double perovskite, whether the trivalent cation is big enough to support octahedral coordination. And that's not covered by the tolerance factor. So for systems like the iodides, that's an additional descriptor that has to be satisfied. So the early work on uh, hybrid perovskite formates is quite interesting. Um, Sletten and Jensen published a paper in 73, so that's kind of 50 years ago, um, with the structure of this uh, copper phase, dimethyl ammonium copper formate. And the funny thing was, I mean, it had the perovskite structure, but they didn't realize that it was a perovskite because they were molecular chemists and they just drew a structure as if it was a molecule and they didn't connect it together the way that we do with all our structures nowadays. And so they, 
they miss the fact that it was a perovskite. If you look back at it and if you build it in, in uh, you know, the software, then you can certainly see that. And, and so it wasn't until Song Gao essentially reproduced what these people had done, and he realized that it was a perovskite, which is very important. And secondly, um, he showed that these materials uh, can undergo antiferromagnetic order when the B cation is a transition metal. And so uh, what's happened in, over the recent years is that you can have all sorts of different amines, not just dimethyl ammonium and metal ammonium, but things like guanidinium, azetidinium, formimidinium, and other things you can't even pronounce. And then in combination, uh, with things like the, uh, m many of the first row transition metals plus uh, magnesium and, and one or two others. So this is actually quite a, a broad platform. What, we actually made this by mistake one day in the lab. One of my students, who was a wonderful chemical engineer, but not a great synthetic chemist, um, made this material. Uh, which was the one that Song Gao had first made, the zinc compound. And we thought, how exciting, when I looked at this crystal structure, and I said, that's a perovskite. And I was not aware of Gao Song's work, but by the end of the afternoon, of course, we knew that we were not the first people to do this. But what I did notice was that the amine in the cavity, this dimethyl ammonium, was uh, rotationally disordered in three equivalent positions around the three-fold axis. And there, there are not many advantages of being old, but one of the few advantages is that you've often seen things over your career uh, that you know, come back to you at the right moment. And I realize that there are a lot of um, things like uh, alkyl ammonium phosphates and so on, which undergo ferroelectric ordering uh, on cooling and at room temperature, they look very much like this. And so Prashant, uh, together with our collaborators uh, in Florida State, Harry Croto had gone to Florida State and Naresh Dalal was there. And Prashant Jain was actually one of Harry's uh, graduate students. And Harry had money but no lab and I had a lab but no money, so he sent pr Prashant over to work with me for three years, initially in Santa Barbara and, and then in uh, Cambridge. And so we did dielectric constant measurements, first of all, and also some low temperature diffraction, and showed that indeed there is a phase transition there. And initially, we didn't dare to say that it was uh, a ferroelectric because we didn't have definitive evidence. And I had a colleague in... Cambridge, who made a living out of proving that most people's ferroelectrics were actually anti-ferroelectrics. But uh, it soon became apparent that it, it was a ferroelectric, and uh, we solved the structure of it. Somebody else had seen our paper, and they made it, and they solved the structure and published it. So we never actually published this, but we got the same results as Tona Senoras Rodriguez, who listened to me talking about it at a meeting in Germany, and... and uh, then did the low temperature crystal structure. So this is a very interesting system. It is a ferroelectric. It does all the things that ferroelectric should do. So you can, but if you re reverse the polarity of the electric field, then you switch the polarization as you, as you can see here. And so this is ordering at about 160 Kelvin. And uh, you can see also this is an SHG imaging above and below the phase transition, and you can see the non-centrosymmetric uh, structure uh, in the low temperature phase from the second harmonic generation using a Thai sapphire laser. So it's a nice experiment, they're not easy to do. And then we done all sorts of things on this in the meantime, but one of the things we've done quite recently is to look in detail at the phase transition and the precise mechanism of the phase transition. And I'm not going to talk about the details. This is just to show you that we did deuterium NMR on this as a function of temperature, and we also did DFT calculations and, and lattice dynamics on it so that we could 
calculate the free energy and the entropy. But there's an interesting thing about this, which um, is the following. If you look at the azide analog, which we also studied, so here's the azide analog. There's a phase transition to a ferroelectric phase on cooling, but there's, and even with DMA cation, there's no order disorder transition. And so the transition is driven by changes in the vib vibrational entropy of the structure. And people ignore vibrational entropy, but it's a very important component of the phase transitions. And in this case, it's the only contribution to the phase transition, to the ferroelectric one. Whereas in the formate case, which we also studied, of course, you have both a contribution to the entropy change from the order disorder of the cation, as the cation locks into a specific position, and you have a concomitant change in the uh, vibrational entropy of the lattice itself, the framework itself. So the next thing that we did, sort of immediately following really the um, discovery of the ferroelectric ordering, um, I'd done a lot of work with CNR Rao, who's on our board and people have mentioned, I did a lot of work in collaboration with CNR on multiferroic materials. These are materials that, for example, order both as a ferroelectric and also as, say, a ferromagnet. And these are very rare animals. And at the time, all the known examples of multiferroics were systems where the ferroelectricity was driven by off-center displacements of cations, like you have in uh, lead titanate um, and bismuth manganate, which is the classic. And I realized that maybe since we, these things will order magnetically and they're ferroelectric, they should be multiferroics. And we published a paper in JAX on this uh, in 2009, and uh, Ramesh from Berkeley published the news and views in, in Nature on it, Emerging Routes to Multiferroics. And I was delighted until I saw that his News and Views article was getting more citations than my original work in JAX. And happily, that only lasted about a year. And then people, you know, this is now a very highly cited paper. But it, it was the first example of a multiferroic that's actually driven by hydrogen bond ordering, which is what we're dealing with here in the order disorder transition, rather than an off-center displacement of, of a metal cation. So it is a, an, it is a, a multiferroic, and there's also a, a sort of magnetoelectric effect. The interesting thing is, if you look at the polarization um, in different uh, fields, and, I, and just magnetic fields, just let me sort of go back. You see the important thing here is that the ferroelectric transitions, it's about, in this particular one, 180, and then the magnetic ordering transitions down at 10 degrees. So it doesn't look like a great candidate to have magnetoelectric coupling. But we were wrong to think that. Luckily, we did measure it. And, and you see here that uh, the magnetoelectric coupling is quite strong. It's field dependent, but it goes all the way up to the ferroelectric phase transition. And it's not clear what the physics of that is. I imagine that we're dealing with some kind of short range order um, in the um, mag magnetic interactions all the way up to the ferroelectric phase transition. So it's a, a true multiferroic. Well, we did a lot of work on the mechanical properties of these formates, which I don't have time to go into, but the mechanical properties are strongly uh, influenced by hydrogen bonding between the amines and the formates, the transition metal itself. And so, for example, we looked at this hydrazinium system, uh, which is a ferroelectric at up to 352 uh, Kelvin, so it's a very uh, sort of good high temperature ferroelectric. And so one thing that we were able to do is show kind of quantitatively that the degree of hydrogen bonding influences the mechanical properties of the system. So this is 
uh, measuring the stiffness of Young's modulus as a function of systems with more and more hydrogen bonding. But we also showed that if you take that hydrazinium with its very high phase transition, that you can actually control the temperature of the ferroelectric phase transition by replacing some of the hydrazinium with, in this case, hydroxyl ammonium, which has less hydrogen bonding. And so it weakens the hydrogen bond interactions that lead to the uh, uh, ordering. And so these things only order at lower temperatures. So you get a, a pretty much a linear relationship between the degree of substitution of the hydrazinium and the, um, the uh, Curie temperature of the ferroelectricity. We did lots of other things in NMR and so on, which I, I don't have time to talk about. So I'm going to switch gear now to talk about the rhenium trioxide type formates, and which are a very interesting family. And so if instead of having, say, an alkyl, alkyl ammonium cation with zinc 2 plus and the uh, formate link as in the perovskite structure. If we replace the zinc by a trivalent cation, we don't need a cation in the cavity. And so we can go from a perovskite of this type to a rhenium trioxide where there's nothing in the cavity. And this is three connected. And we, we wrote a uh, Nature Reviews Materials article on these rhenium trioxide structures. They're absolutely fascinating. And, and of course, Matt's uh, thiocyanate, one of them, belongs into this family here. But much to my surprise, you can make rhenium trioxides with a huge range of different linkers and so on, which had, had not been sort of drawn together previously. And, and so one of the things that this did was focus our attention on the formates that we've been working with for such a long time. And so aluminum formate is, is a very interesting compound, it turns out. And this is the first of these materials to have been made. And it was, it was first reported in 1933. So it's in the Gemellin Handbook of Inorganic Chemistry and it was made from reacting aluminum, hyd uh, aluminum hydroxide and formic acid. And then nothing happened for about 50 years, and then a Russian group reported it, and they reported a, an X-ray powder pattern, but no structure and no idea of the structure. And then some years later, 1999, 15 years later, uh, Gateski and his colleagues uh, in Italy, reported the manganese compound, this manganese uh, formate. And uh, they had a crystal structure. They showed that it's an antiferromagnet. Uh, it has a yarn teller distortion because it's manganese 3 plus and so on. Um, and then in 2007, which was just when we had started the, uh, our other formate work, uh, a Chinese group published a very interesting article, this Qian et al. In, in organic chemistry. And they made the aluminum, iron, gallium, and indium ones. Um, and they reported all the crystal structures. And when I looked at this paper, uh, there's something striking about it, because this structure will only crystallize if it's got carbon dioxide in the cavity. And so in the title of their paper was something like, uh, templating of the formation of aluminum formates by carbon dioxide. And so the carbon dioxide sits in the REO3 cavity, and I'll show you it in a bit more detail in a minute, but it's sort of locked into place by hydrogen bonding with the formate hydrogens. And so I had two thoughts about this. One, can we get the carbon dioxide out without destroying the material? And if you do do that and have then a kind of pristine activated version, will carbon dioxide go back in? Because there's clearly something special about carbon dioxide and this structure type. So Dinesh Mulangi, who uh, worked with me in Singapore, uh, was able to activate the aluminum form. And I'm still amazed that nobody had ever looked at this thing and, 
done it you know, over the last uh, 15 or 16 years, but you can activate it without destroying the structure. And uh, so these are the temperature-dependent powder patterns. Um, as it loses the CO2, and there's a bit of other stuff in the cavities in the asmade material, and you get the pristine uh, aluminum formate with nothing in the cavities. And we call that material, that sort of pristine material, we just call it ALF for simplicity. And ALF is very stable, so in the TGA, once you've activated it, it's stable up to about 250 degrees in air. So it's a very uh, stable material. And so the next question uh, we asked ourselves, well, you know, can we confirm structurally that there's nothing left inside the cavities? Um, so we did the crystal structure as a function of temperature using uh, powder neutron diffraction at NIST, and we, um, with uh, uh, Hayden Evans, who was doing this work with us, who worked with Ramses Shardy and myself in, in Santa Barbara. And so we get beautiful fits. This is just the lowest temperature. And this is just the lattice parameter changing as the lattice gradually ex expands. Down at very low temperatures, it shows essentially zero thermal expansion for about 50 degrees before it starts to take off. So there's absolutely nothing in the cavities. Um, the structure looks like this. The, there's more than one type of cavity. It's still cubic, so it's a very, very simple system, but it is uh, nevertheless um, a bit more complicated. It has two types of cavities. The small ones, which have the hydrogen bonding, of which there are six per unit cell, and then two larger cavities, of which there are two per, per unit cell. So there are eight cavities altogether. And um, so we have very nice characterization, of course. So then the next question is, will the CO2 go back in? And so we looked at that, and yes, the CO2 does go back in. Um, this is the uh, adsorption isotherm for the as-made material that was already known. And of course, since the cavities are filled, nothing goes into it. But this is the adsorption isotherm for the um, activated ALF, and, and it has a substantial uh, CO2 capacity. And, and from the isotherms of function of temperature, we can get the heat of adsorption, which is about 47 kilojoules per mole, depending on the loading. And we also have the uh, BT surface area and isotherm uh, from the same measurement. So that's about nearly 600 meters squared per gram. We then turned our attention to the uh, CO2 loaded material, and we did a whole series of, of neutron diffraction experiments at NIST. Um, this is the neutron diffraction pattern that we just looked at of the pristine ALF, and this is uh, with CO2 in the cavities. And we can see, and we did this as a function of loading and a function of temperature, so we got a lot of data on this. And we know that the small cavity, the CO2 goes into the small cavity in hydrogen bonds, and it locks into a single position. So that's three quarters of the cavities that are nearly full. These are the occupancy. So at uh, sort of one and a half bar, it's about 90% filled. The larger cavity, the CO2 is disordered because there's no hydrogen bonding to lock it in place. So you can see that here. And that has a lower affinity for CO2. So uh, the occupancy of that is, you know, goes up to about 50%. So in the loaded material up, up to this partial pressure of CO2, we have something like nearly 80% of the cavities have got CO2 in. You can only get CO2 one CO2 molecule into each cavity. You can't do more than that. There's not enough space for it. So that's sort of very nice characterization. Um, you may wonder, why did we measure the surface area using CO2 isotherms? And the reason for that is we quickly realized that nitrogen won't go into this structure. Even though nitrogen is kind of minutely larger than CO2, 
it will not go into the structure. And so this is the nitrogen adsorption isotherm, the black one's the as-made material, and then the, the red one's the activated. And so there's virtually no nitrogen goes into it. There's a little bit of leakage depending upon temperature. So when, when you calculate the, um, the IAST selectivity from the separate isotherms, then you get a, a selectivity for CO2 over nitrogen in the vicinity of 350 to about 500. So it has a massive selectivity for CO2 over nitrogen. And of course, we, we started to think about, you know, well, maybe we could use it for flue gas applications, for example, which, um, which Mohammed talked about the other day, which is a very challenging application. Um, we, Piero and Jerry uh, in Singapore did a lot of calculations on this and other uh, sorbates. So we uh, were able to calculate the heat of adsorption in the small cavity, which is about 48 kilojoules per mole, and the large cavity is about 36. So uh, bearing in mind that most of the CO2 goes in the small cavity, that's in really good agreement with our value of 47 from the, uh, from the experiments. The, there's no reason why nitrogen shouldn't go in. It's got a reasonable heat of adsorption, but it basically doesn't go in significantly at any temperature. And so this is a kinetic effect. You know, the nitrogen is just ever so slightly bigger than the CO2, and yet the window into the cavity is too small to admit the nitrogen into the cavity. And interestingly, water has a very favorable heat of adsorption, especially into the small cavity with its hydrogen bonding. But hydrogen, uh, water goes in extremely slowly. We left a sample on the bench for three weeks at NIST and then ran the neutron diffraction, and you don't see any change in the background. It, it just sat there, and it looked like it did when we first activated it. So it's, so it's very stable. So uh, adsorption of nitrogen is not thermodynamically inhibited, but C CO2 has a strong preference for the small cavities where it can enjoy the hydrogen bonding, and the adsorption of water, thermodynamically favorable, but, but also extremely slow at room temperature. So this obviously was, uh, you know, a lot of food for thought as to what to do next. And we were looking at these kinetic diameters uh, on the basis that this is a, a size selective adsorption process into the ALF. And um, we know that nitrogen won't go in. So one of the first things we thought about was maybe oxygen will go in because oxygen's significantly smaller than nitrogen. When I say significantly smaller, it's probably, you know, two-tenths of an angstrom or something like that. It's kind of minute, but it nevertheless is smaller. And um, so separating oxygen from air is something that's of an enormous societal interest. And you saw in, during the pandemic was the shortage of medical oxygen and because most of it's made cryogenically. The only commercial process that I'm aware of that does it using absorbent at room temperature uses lithium zeolites. Things like lithium zeolite X and lithium uh, LSX, low silica X. And these zeolites uh, have a couple of disadvantages. One is that they're hugely sensitive to water. But more importantly, they, take the, they don't take the oxygen out of the air, they absorb the nitrogen out of the air. So you're kind of dragging 80% of the air into the sieve in order to leave behind the oxygen. So you're much better off absorbing oxygen as, as we're doing here. So uh, we tried this and uh, it works very nicely. Um, it will, it especially the adsorption is quite low at uh, room temperature, which is um, not too surprising, as you'll see in a moment. But the adsorption at dry ice temperatures, about 195K, um, so this is the nitrogen adsorption at dry ice temperatures, 
and this is the oxygen adsorption at dry ice temperatures. So it's got a selectivity of, a, of about 100 for oxygen over uh, nitrogen, which is huge in this area. So the commercial zeolites uh, have a selectivity between 5 and 10 for nitrogen over um, oxygen. So we, the kinetics was slow with the pure ALF, so what we did was make uh, solid solutions and expanded the lattice a little bit by doping with uh, iron. And so that does two things. It actually improves the capacity a bit, and it also um, improves the kinetics by a factor of three when we do this. So, and we've studied this in uh, you know, exquisite detail, all sorts of different compositions. And for example, however much iron you put in, nitrogen adsorption remains uh, negligible. So, and with Zhao Dan's group in Singapore, we've done breakthrough measurements, which sort of confirm the, uh, what we saw uh, with the, uh, so this is now using mixed gas, of course, and confirms what we saw with our adsorption isotherms. And so it has several advantages over the zeolites, uh, but one is cost because lithium's expensive, Another is tolerance to moisture, and, and the uh, third one is that we're absorbing oxygen rather than nitrogen. And you, you can cycle it. It's very stable, and so you, this, these things take a long time on the breakthrough, so we didn't do more than um, five measurements. So the, the reason it doesn't absorb well at room temperature is basically because the heat of absorption of oxygen into the ALF is about half of that of the CO2. So you need to cool it down more in, in order to get a good absorption. Um, and oxygen doesn't benefit from any hydrogen bonding because the heat of absorption in the, these are Piero's calculations, in the small cavity is more or less the same as that in the large cavity. Um, and the, so the heat of absorption is about the same, roughly the same, a bit smaller than that of nitrogen, which won't go in. And um, below, it's, it's interesting, this is one of those systems where the, as you heat it up from 198, it loses capacity, and that's perfectly normal because T delta S is getting larger. But as you cool it down, you also lose capacity. So there is a kinetic effect with the oxygen as the uh, framework contracts, and then the oxygen has difficulty getting into the system. So let's go back to the CO2 for a moment, because CO2, so this is another tranche of work. This is a kind of third tranche of work. ALF will separate CO2 from any hydrocarbon, including acetylene, which is uh, sort of has a smaller kinetic diameter than CO2. So that's a bit of a puzzle, and, and we've done calculations, I think we now understand it quite well. But these are the adsorption isotherms for methane and ethane, acetylene, ethylene, and propane, and none of them go into ALF, and, and this is the CO2 under the same conditions. Uh, so the selectivity, if you look at the selectivity of um, CO2 against acetylene, the, the selectivity, which is shown on this left scale here, is almost 10 to the 6. It's absolutely huge. And, and it's amazing because the acetylene, so, you know, it should go in, you, you would have thought. And then uh, for CO2 against uh, methane, the selectivity is sort of approaching 10 to the 4. It's about 3 times 10 to the uh, 3. So th these are incredible materials. Um, so no hydrocarbon will go in. So you could imagine the applications of this, like flue gas applications, where you've got about 30% of the flue gas, not the flue gas, the uh, biogas, where 30% of it is CO2, and uh, the methane won't go in, but the CO2 will, and so on. So that's something that uh, we're starting to look at. And this is how it performs against the uh, other materials that we've looked at uh, that, you know, that have been reported for, um, this is for the uh, 
acetylene at the top there, and that's for the methane down below. So we're doing a lot of work on this. It's not all good news. Let me just explain one thing. Um, it's mainly good news. So these are the pros and cons. Uh, synthesis of ALF requires just two cheap and widely available materials, aluminum hydroxide and formic acid. You don't even need a separate solvent because the formic acid acts as the solvent. It also generates the CO2 that goes into the cavity, so you need an excess of it. And then the materials cost is approximately a dollar a kilo of valve. So it's incredible, uh, incredibly cheap and obviously kind of earth abundant. So it's many, many times cheaper than, than uh, other moths. And we can make kilogram quantities in the lab. It's very easy to scale up, at least in the lab. That doesn't mean you could do it in a large uh, production facility. And, and it's got excellent mechanical properties. They're more similar to those of a zeolite in terms of the Young's modulus and the shear modulus. So like, we, these were calculated numbers, but the shear modulus, of, we measured the shear modulus of ZIF-8 once, and it's about 1, and this is 11 or 12. So it's uh, dramatically better than most zeolites. But for the flue gas application, it's nevertheless problematic because of, once you get above about 30 degrees C, it becomes very sensitive to water. So if you were to use this in a flue gas application where you've got CO2 and nitrogen and a lot of water, uh, then you would need a drying step. And so the question is, and this is more an engineering question, because the MOF is so cheap, could we actually uh, nevertheless save money and include a drying step? For the other applications, you don't uh, need a drying step and, and you're not working at higher temperatures. So that's what, one of the uh, outstanding challenges for it. The uh, other thing we've been looking at, and this is kind of hot off the press, is just the hydrogen storage uh, in, in ALF. And um, it adsorbs hydrogen extremely well. Uh, optimally, it's about 100 degrees Kelvin, which is not a bad temperature to be at. And we get excess hydrogen uptake of about 11, uh, 10 to 11 grams of hydrogen per kilo of valve. And um, there's, a, there's an article in the DOE targets and an article with Jeff Long and some of his collaborators on this in Nature Energy. And they have um, targets. Their target is 18 grams of hydrogen um, per kilo of molecular sieve um, at a cost of $10 a kilo for the sorbate. So, of course, we, don't, we know what the materials cost is. We don't know how much it would actually cost to make it or depends what someone's willing to do. Um, but because we're so close to the capacity target, and because our cost is going to be much lower than anything else that people have looked at, this, at least at 100K, looks as if it's quite competitive. So we're doing, with uh, people at NIST, a techno-economic analysis of this now to see if it really would have legs. So let me just sort of mention one other thing. We've been looking at other ALF analogs, and we have, um, I mentioned that phases with aluminum, manganese, iron, gallium, and indium being made. Dinesh successfully made the vanadium analog and the chromium analog. The chromium analog's a bit tricky because of the kinetics of working with chromium. Um, and we've done extensive work on solid solutions and, and you just saw a bit of it with the iron aluminum, but we've done a lot of stuff on solid solutions to tune adsorption properties and so on. And we've also been looking at these solid solutions for evidence of cation ordering to form double REO3 formates, which, such as this one here, the iron chromium. And this actually works. So what we initially thought were solid solutions, 
and not all were solid solutions, and you get ordering in the center. So this is most unusual because we're getting ordering of two cations which are quite similar in size and with the same charge. But we have a single crystal structure of this, so there's uh, no doubt about it. And we've also got evidence for other formate polymorphs um, with, with transition metals that don't have rhenium trioxide structures. So that's basically my story. Lots of people to thank. Oh, no, this is the conclusion, so I'm looking at the wrong thing. Um, I think the conclusions are fairly obvious. We've got some very interesting um, in, in electrical and magnetic properties with the with the formate perovskites. We know a lot about the mechanism of the phase transition. And then these REO3 formates are a very exciting emerging class of uh, MOFs. I mean, I think it's the simplest MOF in the world, though our chairman may disagree with me on that. But it, it's, it's undoubtedly simple, and it has some exciting adsorption properties for CO2 capture, N2O2 separation, hydrogen storage, and other things that we're working on. So um, these are the acknowledgments. I've mentioned lots of people I, as I've gone along, but people in red are the ones who worked on the most recent stuff that we've done, and, and especially uh, Piero I'm most grateful to, and Craig Brown, who's been heavily involved in the hydrogen stuff at, at NIST, and funding sources both at Cambridge and in Santa Barbara and Singapore. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Tony? Very nice talk, as always. Uh, I just have a question on the entropy that you showed, the vibrational and rotational. Yeah. I didn't quite understand just by changing the ligand. I think in one case it was completely vibrational, uh, where you had nitrogen as the ligand. And then when you made it form it, you get an additional rotational degrees of freedom. But I think that's coming from the A cation. So just by changing the ligand, how can you suppress the rotational entropy? It was not completely clear to me. Uh, maybe so I missed something. We, well, we kind of extracted the entropic contribution from the order disorder transition yes. from yes. the total entropy change yes. to get the vibrational contribution. I completely understand. Yeah. But just by changing, now you are changing the ligand, the nitrogen, to form it, if I understand correctly. And that kind of suppresses this rotational degrees of freedom. I mean, in case of nitrogen, it was completely vibrational. But with the format, you had an additional rotational channel. So this, well, of course, there's no hydrogen bonding to the A side, you've got the same amine, I see. and there's no hydrogen bonding to the A side, so there's nothing to lock it in place. I see. I so see. that's the okay. essence of the reason for it. Okay, thanks. Judith? Yeah, okay, no, brilliant stuff, Tony, really interesting. I like it because it's quite simple, as you say. It's really, you know, nice <laughs> in that way. Um, about the double proskites, do you, do you think you can get the ordering because you have two different cages for them, two different shaped or sized cages for them to go into those cations? Um, no, I don't think that's no. the reason because in the double perovskite uh, formates that I showed you, well, I didn't show you the structure, they don't have the same cubic structure with the two types of cages. So I'm, my thinking about this is that um, you wouldn't normally get this in an oxide because when you synthesize the oxide, you're at very high temperatures. Yeah. And so T delta S is very high. And then the 
uh, disorder gets locked in, a bit like Piero was saying about the phosphorus and silicon in Nasicon. Whereas with, the, uh, with our synthesis of the formates, we're doing, you know, synthesis at about 100 to 130 degrees C. So T delta S is much smaller. And so you don't need what you have in other systems, which is charge differences, to drive the ordering. Even a size difference is sufficient to do it. I see. Okay. Yeah. Another quick question. Sorry. If you manage to overcome the problem of the water absorption, um, the 30 degree C issue, um, and you capture all this CO2, and you, you've got your lovely ALF with loads of CO2 in it, what, what will happen then? Do what you think do you, you can next? bury it and it will be stable? And, you know. Yeah. So, no, I wouldn't do that because you, you wouldn't want to lock up your aluminum formate with the CO2 in the cavity. This would not be useful until you, can do, uh, until you can do something with the CO2. So I took a slide out about this. At such time as hydrogen gets reasonably inexpensive, which will happen sooner or later one way or another with green hydrogen, then what you can do is actually reduce the CO2 to formate and make more aluminum form, you can reduce it to formic acid, make more aluminum formate, and then capture the CO2 again and so on. So converting the adsorbed CO2 to formic acid would be quite attractive. Then you're locking up the CO2 in the framework of the MOF instead of locking it up in the cavity, which is not as robust. So if you calculate the weight percent of CO2 in ALF, forgetting about the adsorbed CO2, but just think of ALF as being aluminum plus hydrogen plus CO2, then it's about 85 weight percent. It's huge. Nice. Other questions or comments? No? I do have a lot of questions, but we'll talk about them later. Please join me to thank Tony.